Hi, this is Brad Keithley, Managing Director of Alaskans for Sustainable Budgets. Welcome to the weekly top three, the top three things on our mind here at Alaskans for Sustainable Budgets for the week of December 6th, 2021. The weekly top three is a regular segment on The Michael Duke Show. The show broadcasts on Facebook Live and via streaming audio from the show's website weekdays from 6 to 8 a.m. I join Michael weekly in the first hour of Tuesday's show from 6.25 to 7 a.m. for a discussion between the two of us about our three issues. We post the podcast of our discussion following the show on the Alaskans for Sustainable Budgets Facebook, YouTube, SoundCloud, Spotify, and Substack pages, also on the Alaskans for Sustainable Budgets website, as well as the projects page on national blog site, medium.com. You can find past episodes of the weekly top three also at the same locations. Keep in mind that in addition to these podcasts, during the week, you also can follow and participate in the discussion with us of these and other issues affecting Alaska's fiscal and economic condition by following us on the Alaskans for Sustainable Budgets Facebook page and through our posts on Twitter. This week, our top three issues are these. First, we discuss how, with oil prices dropping in the wake of the Omicron variant and other events, the administration is facing rougher times ahead on its fiscal proposals. Second, we consider what the federal infrastructure dollars headed our way mean for the state budget. And third, we take a look at what the Department of Interior's new report on federal oil leasing means for Alaska oil. And now, let's join Michael. Let's dive into it today. Uh, number one on the agenda is the discussion about what's happening with the governor. Uh, his uh, budget is not officially due out statutorily until the 15th of, or maybe it's constitutionally even, to the 15th of December. Uh, usually they try and release it a little bit early, but uh, word on the street is, nope, the fluctuation in oil prices is causing some problems. Give us uh, your take on this. Well, up until the uh, Friday after Thanksgiving, uh, the governor's budget seemed uh, on track and seemed uh, uh, to be uh, uh, a good one for him uh, in the sense that uh, there was uh, an increase in oil prices. There have been an increase in oil prices over the fall, uh, and it was going to give him uh, some revenues, some additional revenues uh, that he was touting would enable him to uh, uh, support a, a POMV 5050 uh, PFD, a supplemental uh, PFD during the regular session that would get it to a POMV 5050 uh, uh, PMV for the uh, for the year, and then the Friday after Thanksgiving, uh, all heck broke loose. Um, uh, Omicron, uh, the the appearance of the Omicron variant uh, of uh, the COVID virus uh, spooked uh, the oil markets. Uh, that plus uh, 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 OPEC's decision to uh, continue. Uh, 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 the release of uh, additional volumes of oil at uh, 400,000 barrels uh, a month uh, a day uh, increase uh, for the next month, uh, and as well as the coordinated release, the announcement of the coordinated release uh, by uh, the U.S., uh, Japan, China, India, and others of, uh, of additional barrels from the Strategic Petroleum Reserve, their Strategic Petroleum Reserves, in an effort to drive down uh, price. And that spooked the market uh, to a degree that prices fell from uh, the 80s uh, over the next uh, few days, uh, that Friday, and then uh, the first part of the week following, uh, down into the high 60s, uh, at least for, uh, for Brent and uh, WTI, the West Texas Intermediate, the U.S. price uh, went lower than that. Um, and so the governor's budget that looked, had, looked to be on track uh, uh, to have uh, substantial uh, additional revenues over and above what had been forecast in the spring forecast, at least, uh, all of a sudden didn't look uh, as good. Uh, and that condition has continued largely through the week. Today, looking at prices this morning, prices are recovering some. Uh, they recovered a little bit yesterday. They're, they're recovering some additional amount uh, this morning, uh, but they're not getting back to the levels that, uh, that the uh, uh, the governor had anticipated, I think, uh, when he started making his uh, statements about uh, about uh, uh, a supplemental uh, uh, PFD. Right. Uh, they're down this morning. Uh, well, they're still down this morning below the b below the eighty one dollars that uh, that uh, had been included in the preliminary fall forecast. Um, and so the uh, uh, the speculation is 
and uh, Jeff Landfield has it in uh, uh, in in this week's uh, landmine. Uh, the speculation is the governor will go to December fifteenth, the statutory date uh, end date on which he has to by which he has to announce the uh, budget uh, to announce the budget in the hopes that uh, oil prices uh, climb back to a level uh, to the level that. Uh, that, that they were anticipating right. when they did the right. preliminary fall, fall revenue forecast. Well, let, let's uh, let's analyze one of the major problems here, the big push that the governor was making and the one thing that the uh, the uh, uh, heightened oil prices were going to help him provide was a way to produce this 50-50 PFD, maybe some supplemental stuff and some other things without having to generate new revenue. That's always been the... That's always been the the thorn in the side of uh, his idea of uh, enshrining the the PFD and paying a 50-50 and doing all those things was that they were crying, well, where are you going to get the new revenue? And he was going to say, aha, here it is. Uh, And that, of course, uh, could shoot that all to hell right there. It could. uh, Well, it will if if, uh, oil prices stay uh, at the levels. I, I think there's two things that this dip has caused, even if it comes back up. Um, uh, by by December fifteenth, or even if it comes back up by early January, uh, when uh, when the session starts, it has I think shaken the confidence, uh, shaken confidence in in the uh, in 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 reliance on oil prices uh, 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 coming to save uh, save the governor's budget. Um, if oil prices can dip this quickly, uh, with uh, the announcement of of an Omicron uh, variant. Uh, what's what's to say they're not going to dip again uh, when there when there are other announcements or or stay down when the, when there's other announcements? So I think it's sort of shaking the confidence in whether that number is reliable. I mean, used to we we had savings that we that sort of you know uh, evened out uh, these sorts of fluctuations in the oil market, but now we don't have savings anymore, and so we're we're directly reliant, uh, directly affected uh, on on what the oil price is at any given moment. Time. Uh, and I think, uh, I think it's a, uh, I think, I think the governor is going to have a hard time, even if oil prices come back up, the governor is going to have a hard time selling that they're, that they're at a sufficient level to, to justify uh, what he proposed doing uh, in terms of a supplemental uh, PFD um, uh, to, to, to justify that uh, uh, going through, uh, going through the session. So the other thing, and Go ahead. No, I was just going to say, so do you think that there's some rejiggering, some fast rejiggering going on behind the scenes with what they had already laid out? Well, yeah, he, he uh, I, I would anticipate that he's going to have to go back to the proposal he had before oil prices were coming up, uh, were increasing, which is this draw, this uh, bridge draw, if you will, uh, from the ERA, this is the, uh, the additional draw from the ERA to bridge essentially a bridge loan over the next two to three years uh, to provide for the POMV 5050 PFD and, and for uh, maintenance of, uh, of spending. And, uh, and that, that bridge draw uh, had, had encountered a lot of, a lot of criticism, including from me uh, and others uh, as a way of financing, uh, as a way of financing government. So um, if, if oil prices don't come back up, he's going to have to do something, right? Uh, and uh, and the bridge draw is the most likely thing uh, that uh, that he goes back to, and so he goes back to the criticism he's had uh, he's had of that. Um, and I, it, it's just it's it's a it's a difficult situation. I mean, the other alternative is to is to go back to 2019 and cut spending uh, uh, dramatically to make room for uh, the, uh, the PFD um, and. Uh, he hasn't done that since 2019. He's coming into a campaign year, an election year, and I very much doubt uh, that that's what they want to do either. The third alternative uh, is uh, is to talk about uh, taxes, to, to pay for government. Uh, right. Uh, and I'm sure he wants to avoid that as well. So it puts the administration um, uh, in, a, in a difficult position uh, coming into the budget. And because it comes so late in the cycle, this, this drop in oil prices comes so late in the cycle after after anticipating that oil prices were going to be up, uh, it's probably a lot of scrambling that's going on inside the administration right now. <clears throat> what one long-term thing has remained constant, though, and this is a problem. It's a problem. It was a problem for the governor before oil, the current near-term oil prices went up. It was. It's been a problem uh, as as near-term oil prices have gone up. 
we've discussed it on the show a lot. Uh, the out years, uh, once you get beyond uh, a couple of years, oil prices drop. Uh, the market's anticipating, the futures market is anticipating that uh, oil prices in the future are going to be less uh, than they are currently. That really hasn't changed uh, through this whole uh, this whole near-term oil price cycle. As oil prices went up, the futures markets uh, futures market prices stayed relatively stable with where they had been, uh, and uh, and continue to show huge deficits uh, uh, in the uh, in the out years. And what's happened during the as as current oil prices have come down, those futures prices have have stayed uh, at about the same level. The curve is sort of flattened with oil prices, with near-term oil prices down uh, sort of on the same level as, uh, as the long-term prices. Uh, and even if the even if near-term prices come back up, uh, as I'm sure the governor is hoping, as the administration is hoping, uh, there's no indication that the, that the, future, that the long-term prices are going are gonna to come back up. So the governor, the governor is, is facing a, a long-term problem. When he talks to the legislature about his 10-year plan, even a five-year plan, uh, the governor is facing uh, a difficult discussion, uh, regardless uh, beyond about uh, beyond about year two. Uh, what what this near term price is, has done is make that discussion difficult, even uh, for the first uh, for the first couple of years. Uh, Brad, I'm suffering from a big dose of deja vu here uh, because uh, the oil forecasts have never been accurate. Uh, I mean, really, to any great degree, one way or the other. And this reminds me a lot of the whole Sean Parnell basing his budget on $115 a barrel oil when the markets were going around and it was at $70 when he was releasing the budget. But he was sticking to that forecast because that's what the forecast. I mean, at some point, do you just go either the forecasting is wrong or we fundamentally got to change the way that we we forecast or maybe we've got to figure out a different way to factor the budget you know that's one of the things of the charter of changes is finding a different way to change the funding maybe it's a five-year rolling average of what we've received or something i mean i don't know but what are your thoughts well that'd be that as i said you know in the old days we had savings so if you missed the forecast by a little bit you just dipped into savings or you added to savings uh but we don't have that now i mean we, we we're, we're scraping at the bottom of the barrel so we don't have that savings to say well you know, I project seventy-two dollars. I may or I project eighty-one dollars, which is what they projected for what the preliminary fall forecast projects. I projected for eighty-one dollars is going to come in at seventy-two, but I've got savings to be able to to tide us over. We don't have that uh, anymore. So, yeah, I think I think long term, what this leads to is a reevaluation of of how you do budgeting and and what you use for the oil price. But the problem that the administration faces is if you go back five years, you go back three years, you go back two years, uh, oil prices are down. Right. Um, and so you and so you have a hole in your budget, which requires that you either, that you address it either through, again, going back to 2019 and, re, and trying to reduce spending. That didn't go so well. Uh, the bridge loan idea that, uh, that the governor has come up with, that hasn't uh, uh, met a whole lot of uh, support. Uh, or uh, you, you use taxes to... Uh, as Governor Hammond suggests, you use taxes to uh, to fill in the uh, to fill in the gap, and that's uh, going to have criticism as well. So, it's 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 long term. The right thing to do is to is to redo the way we do use oil prices or or calculate oil prices uh, in the budget. But in any given year, uh, the way we've been going with oil prices, in any given year, doing that ends up creating a hole uh, that you then have to deal with in some fashion, and so. You know, past governors, this governor uh, uh, don't want to don't want to redo uh, don't want to redo that mechanism, and and they then end up being the one that has to deal with that hole. Oh my goodness! And Randy starts with us this morning. What we should do is come up with a new PFD law that fits and that is expandable. We have a PFD law already, and we just can't even follow it. I mean, the Alaskans should be getting first call on the earnings of that. And uh, and then it, we would see the true cost of government. It would be exposed uh, because then they would have to say, well, look, we paid the PFD, but we don't have enough money. And so now we need taxes and the, and the real cost of government would be exposed and uh, people would know what was going on when that call for taxes would be uh, would be right out there in the open and they would understand it. Right, Brad? Exactly. I mean, what Randy's proposing essentially is to tax the PFD. Uh, to cut the PFD, and, and, and it, which is a way of taxing the PFD uh, and shoving the burden to middle and lower income Alaska families who would who would absorb 
the biggest share of the burden by uh, by doing that to to pay for government, um, and that's what we've been doing the last five years. It's it's it has the largest adverse impact on Alaska families, has the largest adverse impact of all the options on the overall Alaska economy. Uh, that's what we've been doing, and 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 continuing that is just the continuation of shoving the burden on middle and lower income Alaska families. If we are going to make uh, Alaskans pay for a part of their part of their own government, we should do it much more equitably uh, and much more fairly. We should we should burden all uh, Alaska families uh, to the same degree as opposed to shoving it just off on middle and lower income Alaska families. Which, of so, course, which, of course, is your argument for the flat tax, which, again, I think runs up into the same problem. Personally, I still think runs up into the same problem that Randy's issue is, which is. How are we going to make the legislature more fiscally responsible by giving them more money? I mean, that you know, what? that that's that's the bottom well, line. Yeah, and that's and 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 that's what the uh, spending cap uh, is for. I mean, the working group, uh, the the fiscal policy working group, the bicameral, bipartisan fiscal policy working group uh, uh, that came up with the proposal addressed that issue and said uh, uh, we ought to have a spending cap. The governor's proposed. Uh, a spending cap. So that's that's the response to those who say, uh, you know, you, there's no cap on revenue. I mean, there's no cap on revenue if you use PFD cuts. We've got another what 600 some odd billion dollar or million dollars to go. Uh, I, I slipped over to the federal side for a moment when I said billion. We got another 600 million uh, odd dollars to go in uh, in PFD cuts that the that the that the legislature could take. So it's not it's not a problem. Taxes don't create this additional revenue problem. The, the additional revenue problem sits there even with the PFD by just by the legislature taking uh, additional uh, PFD cuts. The way to solve this, this the, the spending problem is to put the spending cap on that uh, both the governor and the, uh, and the fiscal policy working group talked about. How do we put on a spending cap that has teeth, though? I mean, that's part of the problem. I mean, we have a spending cap built into the Constitution, which is useless at this point. Statutory caps are useless because the legislature has shown such a disdain for statute anyway. So how do we put in a spending cap? Uh, we've got two and a half minutes here. How do we put in a spending cap that actually has teeth and, and, and works and works in the long term? Not just for the next two or three years, but works in the long term. Well, we've talked about this on the show before. I think a spending cap that's tied to revenue uh, that 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 keeps the uh, uh, spending limited to the revenues that you have uh, is uh, is is the appropriate way to go. Um, the uh, we have various spending caps that have been proposed out there. Some uh, base it on spending and then increase. You know, it, go to a certain base level of spending and then increase that by inflation. But that I think. Can get just out of hand as out of hand as the current spending cap that's in the Constitution. I think one based on revenue, uh, which keeps uh, keeps spending tied to revenue uh, uh, and uh, and and accounts for you know revenue may go up, revenue may go down, but smooths that across a five year period. We we're talking about that with oil. Just do it generally with revenue, um, uh, uh, and uh, and keeps uh, a spending tied uh, to revenue. That way, if future Alaska generations want to increase revenue by passing taxes, uh, they can do that. Um, but if they don't want to do that, then if they choose not to do that, then spending uh, stays tied to revenue. You can't uh, increase uh, you can't increase spending unless you have the revenue to do it. Which, again, goes kind of back to what I was talking about earlier, figuring and factoring budgets on a five-year rolling average of past revenue, because, again, we can always say it's going to be $115 a barrel, but we, we know that that's not necessarily going to be the truth for sure. Yeah, exactly. Uh, uh, and, then, and then you put that and then you put that spending cap on revenue, you put it in the Constitution, and that's how that's how it becomes a... Uh, enforceable in a way that the legislature can't end run it. Right, which of course is what they really, they that's why they've been so reticent to do anything constitutionally because they know that their hands would get tied, I mean, at this point. I mean, they haven't, we've had a handful of different uh, constitutional uh, initiatives go out there and there's so much resistance in the legislature to have any of those things because they understand that when that happens, the party is over uh, for them. Um, 20 seconds, 30 seconds here, Brent. Well, but I think the working group uh, uh, came to a consensus about that. I mean, the working group uh, uh, document uh, proposal recommendation uh, recommends uh, a spending cap, and that's from the left, left and the right. So right, right. I think that I, I think the the basis is out there. 
Brad Keithley, Alaskans for Sustainable Budgets. We're coming up on the break, Brad. Number two is the infrastructure. We're, you know, lots of lots of money, lots of federal lucre about to run into the state. And uh, is it good or bad for us? Give us a quick tease. Well, there's a lot of good about uh, about the uh, the federal infrastructure bill and uh, and the dollars that are going to come into the state as a result of uh, as a result of the infrastructure bill. But I have concerns about what that's going to do to Alaska budgeting going forward. Uh, and so uh, I'm going to talk about that in a second. All right. We're continuing with Brad Keithley now. Alaskans for Sustainable Budgets, the weekly top three. We're into number two, the largest infrastructure bill in the history of the world. Um Past and uh, everybody's patting himself on the back. Um, everybody's patting, uh, you know, our congressional delegation on the back because look, look at how much bacon they brought home to to us, to the babies. You know, uh, nobody's bothered to really ask what it's going to cost in the long run, and does it really, does it really help the infrastructure in the United States? Uh, we've seen some of the crazy programs that are included in there that have absolutely nothing to do with infrastructure. But let's focus on. The infrastructure here in the state of Alaska, uh, there was a piece in the ADN that talks about this, uh, a glowing piece from, uh, it's, a, it's an opinion piece from, um, uh, who was it? Erica Jensen, who writes this glowing opinion piece, slapping everybody on the back and saying how great it's going to be for Alaska. Brad, what say you on the infrastructure bill here? Well, I, I, I would point out that Erica is uh, the executive director of the Alaska American Council of Engineering Companies, uh, Alaska, who are going to greatly benefit. I mean, mm. one, of the big benefic- one of the big beneficiaries out of the infrastructure uh, package is engineering companies that are going to get to engineer all of these, uh, all of these uh, new roads and, uh, and bridges and, uh, and ferries and, and that sort of thing. So you would expect, uh, you would expect uh, that sort of glowing uh, recommendation. I, I, think, I think the infrastructure bill... Uh, it does one thing that's really good for from the perspective of the state budget, which is which is what I want to focus on in this segment. One thing that's really good, and then one thing that maybe not is not so good. Um, and we need to be concerned. We need to be concerned about the latter as we as we think about the former. Uh, the thing that's really good is it takes pressure off the state budget, uh, off the state capital budget. There's been a lot of of of, of, of push. Uh, a lot of effort uh, the last few years as we've had low capital budgets to increase the capital budget, find ways to increase uh, the capital budget, either by simply just increasing the capital budget at the expense uh, of other things, perhaps additional PFD cuts, uh, or uh, funding a, a, a taking a, a general obligation bond uh, out to the public and trying to get a, a bond. Uh, passed that would fund a bunch of additional uh, a bunch of additional capital uh, projects, which is fun while it lasts. I mean, debt's always fun while it lasts, but then you know future generations uh, would have to pay the bill by uh, by paying the bond back uh, plus interest. Um, so it, this the federal infrastructure bill I think takes a lot of the pressure off of uh, off of you know those who have been pushing for a state capital budget. There's going to be a lot of money. Uh, coming into Alaska for capital projects, bridges, roads, uh, uh, transportation, broadband, uh, uh, other forms of infrastructure, ferries, other forms of infrastructure. A lot of money coming coming in from the feds, and I think uh, I think we can we can comfortably allow the state uh, budget to sort of take a back seat to uh, to that uh, influx uh, uh, coming in. I think. Uh, Increasing the state capital budget in the face of how much federal money is going to come in would be a, just a foolish thing to do. So that's the good thing. takes takes pressure off the state capital budget. Long term, this is what my concern is. We build a whole lot of more bridges, roads, um, uh, uh, ferries, uh, uh, broadband, uh, and with the with the federal budget, and then federal money, and then the federal money leaves. It, it runs out. We've built all these things. And then everybody looks to the state capital budget uh, or the state budget to <laughs> to maintain them, um, and and so I think it's important as we go through, uh, and and as we talked about before, there's not there's not a whole lot of scope in the in the in the state budget to to absorb a whole lot more uh, uh, cost. So I think it's incumbent as we go through the planning and the and the development of these projects uh, from. Uh, uh, from the using the federal funds, that we think about what the impact is longer term uh, on the state budget once uh, once all this money has uh, has been spent. 
the 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 worst thing we could do is set up you know a, a, a very costly system funded by the feds but then costly to maintain over the long term and just dump all of that maintenance costs uh, off on uh, future future generations or possibly as as bad uh, create a bunch of costly uh, infrastructure costly to maintain and then future budgets are con as constrained as the current budgets are and all of it all of it sort of crumbles away as we don't have the money to uh, to maintain it so it's a it, it's a it's a good in the near term uh, 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 development for the state in the sense of bringing all this additional money in that I think is going to take pressure off of uh, the state capital budget, but uh, a concerning development for the long for the long term uh, in terms of uh, how are we going to pay for it after the Fed money goes? Well, away. because it's a microcosm of the of the whole idea that somehow government is what props up an economy. Right. I mean, these are all people. Oh, they look at all these get this government money that's going to create new jobs and do all these things. But it's always short term. It's always in the short term. And they're picking winners and losers. I mean, I, I love it. Every discussion on this in the state of Alaska, no matter which article that I've read or who's written it, talking about this and that. And of course, it goes to the broadband and how we're going to put all this infrastructure in for Internet and all this stuff. And, you know, all the companies that are mentioned. For example, Starlink is about to launch in Alaska. I mean, they're already launched, obviously, into the sky, and they're testing it all over the place. But Alaska is going to be one of those places, and they're going to blow out of the water technologically and with without the having to have the hard on-the-ground infrastructure of a lot of this stuff. But that's not discussed anywhere. That's not an option. They're going to pick the companies that, are, of course, been you know, playing in their court, so to speak, this whole time. We're going to see the GCIs and others that are going to be reaping the rewards of this. So, again, it's government picking winners and losers and stifling, in my opinion, innovation. Well, it certainly does that. But but we're, we've sort of crossed, we're sort of crossing that bridge, Michael. I mean, the money's coming to Alaska. Nobody's going to turn the money down. Uh, and, uh, and, and, and those sorts of selections, those sorts of decisions – are going to be made. You you hope they're made in the best in the best way possible. You hope they're not uh, they're not uh, 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 anti competitive or or one sided. But the the money's coming in, uh, and that's uh, that's going to be uh, an issue that uh, we're going to have to deal with. I, my my concern is we deal with it in a way that uh, that looks really good now, really shiny new toys now, uh, but uh, add 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 even more to the maintenance burden. Uh, the long-term cost burden burden once the uh, once the federal money goes away. So, so Brad, so Brad Keithley is emperor for a day. I mean, if you had the decision, I mean, because you're saying nobody's going to turn down the money. I mean, if I was in charge, I'd turn down the money. It wouldn't make me popular, but I mean, I, I, but anyway, you're 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 emperor for a day. How would you how would you make it so that it's not so shiny and we're on the hook for it down the road, kind of thing? Well, I would I. I and, and I and hopefully this will be done. I would require uh, uh, long term forecasts of what the costs are going to be of, of imposing this. And I would require that uh, if you can do it with the federal money to set up endowments, uh, maintenance endowments uh, uh, out of the uh, out of the out of the federal money that's coming in uh, that that provides that's invested and provides an additional revenue stream uh, to maintain those items that you built uh, uh, as you go. Uh, I, I'm not, I've not delved into the federal legislation enough to figure out if, uh, uh, if, uh, an endowment set aside is something that you can do with those bills, but I certainly, certainly would look at it. Uh, and, uh, and, and, and in any event, even if you can't do that, uh, look at the long-term costs, uh, of, of these projects. Some are going to have higher long-term costs. They're going to be newer technology. They're going to be more, uh, uh, shiny toys than uh, than others, uh, and I would uh, I would favor those that have uh, the lower uh, lower long term maintenance costs than uh, than than some of the others. Eskimo Libertarian in the chat room says something that I've been thinking for a long time, uh, and he says it's worrisome how folks aren't more disturbed by the amount of spending and money money printing. I think he's speaking specifically about this uh, the infrastructure bill. But it's worrisome that people aren't more concerned about it. I know CAFR and some of these, uh, you know, some of the other organizations that uh, that we've talked to on the program here, they're concerned. But the amount of money that we're borrowing and printing and just the spending, it's it should people should be disturbed. They should be freaking out. Yeah, we went from twenty trillion dollars of, uh, of of national debt to thirty trillion dollars, sort of in the blink of an eye, 
uh, uh, between the end of the Trump administration and the uh, uh, and the beginning of the Biden administration. It's just amazing how much additional amount uh, has uh, has been added, and that's that's hugely concerning. I mean, we're we're burdening future generations. We're leaving we're leaving a huge burden to future generations in terms of in terms of, of the debt and interest co- and uh, and interest expense that they're going to have to have to deal with. In no way, shape, or form is the is the federal government. Uh, uh, federal budget uh, in any form uh, sustainable at, uh, at, at current levels. Um, yeah. But it, they are, they are printing the money. They are sending some of it to Alaska. So, uh, so we're going to have to deal with it one way or the other. It, yes. It'd be great if the federal government didn't do that, but the federal government has done that. Uh, and, and, and we need to deal with the consequences. Yeah. And none of our, uh, none of our elected officials seems to think that it's a point of concern, which is concerning. <laughs> But, you know, it is what it is. Let's dive into number three, which is this brand new report from the Interior Department on oil and gas leasing across the country. Um, uh, you got a chance to see it. Give us your thoughts on it. What uh, what's what's the hubbub, bub? So this is this is the report that uh, the administration uh, said they were they were going to defer uh, a lot of oil and gas leasing decisions uh, until they got this report back from Interior uh, it was announced as a report to look at the environmental consequences of, uh, of oil and gas leasing. Uh, and the concern that I had and others expressed at the time that, uh, that the administration started setting aside decisions based upon this report was, you know, what was this report going to say about long-term environmental costs? Was it going to uh, target Alaska uh, as, the, as the Arctic nation or the Arctic part of, uh, of the U.S.? Uh, was it going to impose all sorts of new environmental terms and conditions? Um, and, and the report comes out, and it has none of that. Uh, the report comes out, and it's all about uh, 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 leasing costs uh, and royalty rates, and whether royalty rates ought to be increased, and and uh, and whether there ought to be uh, uh, additional factors taken into account uh, in, uh, in 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 the royalty rates. There's very few, very little uh, discussion at all about environmental conditions. So. That really has there's there's really two things uh, in terms of its impact on Alaska. One, it, it's a big nothing uh, in terms of imposing additional environmental restrictions on Alaska on, on federal lease development um, uh, in Alaska. It, it really it doesn't do that. So the concerns that we had at the time that the that the, the study was announced uh, have gone away. Uh, but two, that means there's another likely another shoe to drop out there. Uh, someplace in terms of uh, in terms of additional environmental restrictions uh, that may uh, that may apply to to federal oil and gas development not only uh, in Alaska but uh, but in the lower 48 as well. So it's it there was a lot of it, there was a lot of build up to this report, a lot of uh, concern about this report. The report doesn't live up to any of that. Uh, it may increase royalty rates that are that that are required for new uh, uh, leases. Frankly, Alaska would benefit out of that because we share in federal royalty. So, to the extent it doesn't drive away investment, uh, that may be a positive. Uh, but in terms of the environmental restrictions, I mean, the, the the report was set up by an executive order from the president that talked about we're going to look at the environmental consequences of of long term oil and gas leasing. Uh, in terms of doing that, it doesn't uh, doesn't do anything. So, it's a it's a positive in the sense that it didn't impose new restrictions. It's a positive in the sense that uh, that Alaska wasn't you know, even mentioned, uh, 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 wasn't even broken out uh, in the report. Uh, it's a it's a it, it, it it's a foreboding in the sense of well, there's there must be another shoe to drop out there someplace, uh, but we'll fight that battle uh, fight that battle when it comes up. I guess I I guess I would add I'm really surprised by the uh, by the Department of Interior report. I mean, I, everybody had sort of been bracing for what this report bracing in the sense of, of tense and getting ready for what this report might say. Um, and, and it, 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 it's a nothing burger in, in terms of, in terms of its impact, uh, on, uh, on oil and gas development. It says we ought to, it, it essentially says we ought to charge more for oil and gas leases. Uh, we ought to take some additional factors into account, uh, in issuing leases, but it doesn't say stop leasing. It doesn't say don't lease in Alaska. It doesn't say don't lease, uh, don't lease for oil, but lease for gas. It doesn't say anything that's that's related to the uh, to the environmental issues. It just says uh, just just basically says charge more. 
Um, and you know, as I say, there's that's a good and bad for Alaska. If it, we 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 revenue share with the Fed, so if there's additional revenues that are justifiable coming out of federal leases, then great, uh, uh, we'll get a share of that. Uh, you just you don't want to do it to the point where uh, where it inhibits investment, but uh, but if there's additional revenue, that's great. But there's nothing there's really nothing in it that's responsive to the executive order that set it up, um, and that's that's just a I think that's a surprise to the uh, to the whole industry, but a beneficial surprise in the sense that uh, right that it doesn't doesn't carve uh, any additional. Uh, doesn't put any additional limits on Alaska federal development. Well, they've been it's they've been sending such mixed messages. I mean, the 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 energy policy coming out of the Biden administration is so confusing. Uh, I mean, you know, they're 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 champions on the one side, but then they do this other thing, and you're like, wait a second, I you know, it it's very it seems very convoluted and disjointed. It is, and it's because it's because I think of of the price uh, consequences of restricting oil and gas development. I mean, so so we saw, you know, restricted, we, we saw restricted oil and gas development. We saw, we've seen prices fly up as a result of that. There hasn't been shale development. There hasn't been other significant U.S. offshore development. There hasn't been significant investment or development anywhere in the world. And so, and so demand or supply has been restricted, prices fl- flown up. And the administration's response to that, I, I think that's what's muddled the administration's response. The uh, Deputy Secretary of Energy was at the World Petroleum Con- uh, Conference, Congress, World, World Petroleum Congress yesterday, uh, that's meeting in uh, in Houston this year, uh, and he gave a speech uh, saying, "You know, you shale developer, shale oil developers out there, you need to you need to get drilling, you need to get more supply on the market so we get uh, so price gets under control," and and the reaction of the audience was just you know stunned. This is the administration now telling U.S. developers uh, to go develop uh, go develop more oil. Uh, just weeks after uh, after uh, uh, the, the the environmental conference in Glasgow said stop drilling. So it's right. it, it is a mixed message, and that mixed message is being driven, I think, by price um, and uh, and the administration's uh, desire to uh, at, at the same time as they want to stop development and stop uh, additional drilling. They want to keep the price down. And those two just don't go together. All right. Well, that does it for today. Brad Keithley, Alaskans for Sustainable Budgets. Next week, Brad's going to be appearing on the show on Monday because he's going to be traveling on Tuesday. So we'll be looking for the weekly top three then. Brad Keithley, thanks, my friend. Thanks for coming in and uh, joining us. I appreciate you being part of it. Michael, as always, thanks for having me. Well, that's a wrap for another week's edition of the Weekly Top 3 from Alaskans for Sustainable Budgets. Thank you again for joining us. Remember that you can find past episodes on our YouTube, SoundCloud, Spotify, and Substack pages. And keep track of us during the week on Facebook and Twitter. This has been Brad Keithley, Managing Director of Alaskans for Sustainable Budgets. We look forward to you joining us again next week on the Weekly Top 3.